Thank you for joining us today. I hope you all can hear me. Um, this is our Waste of Wisdom webinar on the life cycle assessment and economics of torrified biomass. My name is Tom Waddell, and I work with uh, Craig Rawlings at Forest Business Network, and I think many of you probably saw uh, this webinar in our newsletter, and we really appreciate you joining us today, and we're excited to present this information. Um, Forest Business Network is a partner in the Waste of Wisdom Project and in charge of outreach, so we're very pleased to be a part of this. Now, before we move into the presentations today, if you have any issues with sound or technical problems, please type your questions in the chat bar to the right. It'll be the right sidebar, and you'll see a little chat uh, uh, symbol. And uh, let us know. We'll do our best to help you. If for some reason we can't or we're not successful in helping you uh, hear or see the presentation, we are recording this webinar, and we will post it on the webinars page of the Waste of Wisdom website uh, very soon after uh, the webinar ends, and we will let you all know when that recording is available. Uh, if you have any questions about uh, the material in the presentations today, please let us know in the Q&A section. It's in the very bottom right sidebar, and we'll uh, uh, do our best to answer those questions during the course of the seminar. Uh, uh, or the webinar, or at the very end during the Q&A session. Now, without further ado, I'm going to pass this on to Mark Severy. Mark, uh, give me one minute, and we'll get you started up here. The webinar today. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar today, which is focused on the life cycle assessment uh, and economics of torrified biomass. Uh, this webinar is the first in a series of three webinars held under the, uh, this year under the Waste of Wisdom Project. The next webinar, which is just around the corner, August 23rd, will focus on the life cycle assessment and economics of biochar production. My name is Mark Severy. I'm a research engineer at the Schott Energy Research Center, which is located at Humboldt State University. Today, I'll give a brief introduction to the topic before letting my colleagues from the Forest Service Forest Products Laboratory um, deliver the main results from this presentation. <clears throat> At the end, uh, we'll have a Q&A session, and uh, I hope we can address any of your comments and concerns at, at that point. This webinar will present results from the Waste of Wisdom Project, which was a $5.8 million project funded by the Department of Energy, led by a team of researchers from universities, the Forest Service, private companies, along with three biomass conversion technology partners, which we worked with. Let's start by just describing the motivation for this project to give you some background. The Waste of Wisdom Project is investigating methods to make valuable bioenergy and bio-based products such as torrified wood, biochar, and briquettes using forest residuals. Forest residuals are immense and underutilized resource. Transportation costs have become, uh, have been prohibitively expensive due to their low bulk density and low market value of, of uh, forest residuals. Overcoming this, this economic barrier to harvest these residuals requires increasing the efficiency of transportation and or increasing the value of residuals before uh, transporting them out of the forest. Our project has researched converting forest residuals <clears throat> into products such as uh, densified biomass briquettes, torrified biomass, or biochar, as shown on the screen. Uh, the project had three main focus areas. Dr. Hanson uh, led the first area, which was to research innovative methods to harvest forest residuals and produce a high-quality feedstock with low moisture and ash content. Secondly, the group I work with at the Schatz Energy Research Center partnered with industrial equipment manufacturers to understand how biomass conversion technologies can process forest residuals to produce these products. And lastly, um, the third group, use data generated from the task I worked with uh, to perform economic and environmental analyses uh, to determine the benefits of these systems. This webinar will focus on the results from the economic and environmental results. Here's just a brief outline of what we're going to cover today. So I'm just going to continue with the background for a little bit longer, just a couple more slides. And then we'll jump into the results from the LCA. And then lastly, Ted will provide some uh, of the economic results. Torf action uh, 
is a treatment method that can be applied to uh, raw biomass torrefaction improves the fuel properties of raw biomass to make it more suited for power generation or long distance transportation. Torrefied biomass has lower moisture content, increased energy density, it's resistant to uh, moisture uptake, requires less energy to grind, has, has greater energy density when compressed into briquettes, and is a more homogeneous fuel when compared to raw biomass. This makes torrefied biomass more suitable for as a renewable fuel for power generation and heating. Torrefied biomass can be used in newer existing power plants or as, in a, drop, as a drop in replacement for coal to provide renewable baseload power. Torrefied biomass is a low net carbon energy source, and due to its increased energy density, low grinding energy, and hydrophobicity, it can be used with existing coal power infrastructure and fuel handling and processing equipment. Torrefied biomass is produced by heating biomass in the absence of oxygen to temperatures between approximately 250 and 320 degrees Celsius. The final product can be identified into either pellets or briquettes before shipping and combustion. Uh, our project focused on making briquettes out of this material. Um, we did that uh, in a demonstration scale pilot plant. Uh, to produce these torrefied briquettes, which is uh, what we're going to focus on uh, today. Uh, this was a half a ton per hour plant set up in Samoa, California uh, in the summer of 2015. Uh, we used a tan oak feedstock collected from local forest thinning operations. The torrefied are used in electronically electrically heated continuous screw conveyor produced by Norris Thermal Technologies. The briquetter was a hydraulic ram briquetting press produced by rough briquetting systems. Electricity for the system, as you can see on the screen, was provided by a, a diesel-powered generator set, uh, but electricity could also be provided by a biomass-powered gasifier generator, and I believe some of the uh, life cycle assessment uh, results focus on all this alternative electricity generation set. Data were collected from the system uh, to determine different uh, to determine the optimal operating conditions and to collect data for the economic and environmental life cycle assessment. After analyzing the operational data and the quality of the products, uh, our team shared the results with the rest of the researchers who analyzed the system performance in economic and environmental terms. Next, uh, I'm just going to hand off the presentation to Sevda and Rick from the Forest Products Laboratory to discuss the results from the life cycle assessment of this operation. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, in my portion of the webinar, uh, I'll be discussing about the life cycle assessment analysis of um, terrified briquette production. Um, in waste tourism project, um, the project couples uh, harvesting forest residues um, and the forest, uh, the forest operations with fire conversion technologies. In this case, we are focusing on the torrefaction in order to produce um, torrefied briquettes. And our subtask focused on um, the environmental assessment, sustainability assessment of producing torrefied briquettes from forest residues. Um, so this will include the um, analysis using the life cycle assessment tool in order to quantify the environmental impact um, and looking the whole life cycle stages within the supply chain of certified briquettes and identify the areas for improvement um, that would enhance the environmental sustainability of the system. Um, I will go over briefly on the methodology we followed. So um, we are using the LCA, which is a quantitative decision-making tool that is used to quantify the environmental impact of a product system. Um, looking at the entire life cycle. So this tool allows us to um, quantify the environmental impact resulting from the operation and um, provides us an inventory um, of all the inputs, energy and material inputs to the system, as well as uh, all the emissions and waste released from our system. And eventually it allows um, us to promote our environmental sustainability by identifying the hotspots and the processes which um, has high environmental burden in the supply chain. 
So in this um, analysis, we follow the ISO guidelines, um, and which basically uh, the methodology covers five core steps of um, life cycle assessment. And for the um, analysis, we use Simopro software to model our LCA and the um, life cycle impact assessment results. Um, and for the environmental impact assessment, we use um, Tracy impact assessment methods. In this study, uh, in order to normalize the environmental impact results, we use the functional unit. Um, and this functional unit allows us to compare different um, scenarios on the um, same basis. In this case, uh, our functional unit was one kilowatt hour of electricity generated at power plant. And the scope of the study was um, cradle to grave, which started from extraction of the raw materials, um, which we consider it starts at nature, everything we retrieve from the nature, and goes through the product production and ends at the um, end of life of our product. Um, so we consider this um, a nature to nature um, system boundary. In this study, manufacturing and disposal of the equipment and infrastructure is not considered within the scope of the study because of um, lack of information on this, since surfaction is an emerging um, technology. We did not have information on the um, equipment manufacturing, uh, disposal, and infrastructure. Um, regarding the data inventory, our, um, most of our primary major data was coming from the operational runs performed within the waste tourism project. This includes the forest operations and the operation of um, vegetator, turfire, um, gasifier, and the dryer um, processes. And the secondary data comes from USLCI database and existing literature on biomass surfaction and um, previous LCA studies. And this secondary data includes, for instance, the production of electricity at coal power plant, or production of propane that is used um, as a fuel source in our system for um, heating. Um, in addition, if um, we have process data, but we are lacking some um, data that we require to do the analysis, we use theoretical calculations and estimations with the existing data we have. So as I mentioned, our um, system boundary starts at the um, cradle, which is considered as the logging residues that is left on the forest floor. Um, the, the first step is the feedstock procurement, where um, we take the forest residues, um, load them, and um, transport them to a secondary landing, which we um, have our bioconversion technology site um, is located, uh, which we call the BCT site. Um, at the BCT site, we have uh, feedstock preparation processes which are used to um, achieve the feedstock properties that, um, that they can be used in the bioconversion um, technologies, which are the briquetter and the torifier. Um, these processes include the chipper, screener, and the dryer. After drying process, we have um, two process lines. Um, the first one is um, the chips after, the, after drying goes directly to the briquetter, where we generate non torrified briquettes. And the second line is when, after drying process, we send the chips to the torrefaction unit, and after the torrefaction, they're briquetted and we generate torrefied briquettes, TOB. And these two products um, in our scenario analysis are distributed to the closest power plant to generate electricity. So for the analysis, uh, we have two base cases which we generate electricity through um, co-firing torrified briquettes and non-torrified briquettes with, at a cold power plant. And we have um, scenario analysis. So one thing about this process is um, our operations is um, performed near woods. It's a near woods operation, and the major idea, the, the objective is to process the um, solid biofuel close to the source where the feedstock is. So we um, tackle the problems about the logistics, um, which would help us to decrease the transportation costs. So um, we need remote power to run our systems, uh, and we have two options for that, as uh, Mark mentioned earlier, wood gasification and diesel electricity. 
So we look at the environmental impact of, um, of these uh, systems. And another um, thing we look at is uh, we pro produce um, tor gas at the torrefaction unit. We um, look at the environmental impact if we utilize this tor gas uh, within the system, what would be the um, resulting impact instead of just playing the tor gas um, after it's produced. And another thing we considered is the pile and burn credit. Um, especially in the Pacific Northwest, the common um, way of uh, handling the uh, forest residues is to pile and burn. So we assume in this case, if we were not uh, using the forest residues for um, biofuel production, they would be left on the forest floor and about 50% would be subject to pile and burn and we consider the credits um, resulting from this, um, this application. Um, so I will go over the products we, have, we generated in this project. Um, so the feedstock coming to our um, process has a moisture content about 20%. And it is um, after the production of TOB torrified briquette and non-torrified briquette, uh, the moisture content of torrified one is around 0.6% and it's around 8% for the non-torrified briquette. And you can see here the um, volatile matter content of the torrified briquette is lower because of the um, removal of the volatile matter at the torrefaction process where we um, capture them in the tor gas. Also, the heating value of the torrified briquette is expect as expected. It's um, more concentrated at the um, torrified briquette compared to non-torrified ones. So if you look at the global warming impact results for the torrefied briquettes in order to generate one kilowatt hour of electricity at the power plant. Um, so first I want to um, emphasize the details of this, uh, of this scenario where we utilize the tor gas in the dryer process and um, we are supporting our electricity um, consumption by um, the wood gasifier. Um, which is drying process, torrefaction process, and the briquetting process are supported by um, the gasifier. Um, and in this case, um, torrefaction and the drying has the highest contribution to the um, overall global warming potential. And this is resulting from the propane used in, in, in these systems. And we use propane um, since the tor gas generated um, has, is, is a weak gas in terms of heating value, we had to um, supplement it with um, propane, which increased the global warming potential resulting from these processes. Um, and it's followed by the grinding, which is occurring uh, at the power plant um, before it's uh, subject to combustion. And uh, we can see here that the other feedstock preparation processes, um, the procurement, chipping, and screening, does not have a major effect in the overall um, global warming potential. And uh, if you look at the cradle to gate system boundaries, where um, the gate is we produce our torrified briquette before it's distributed to the power plant, um, we consume around 0 0.16 megajoules of fossil fuel in order to generate one megajoules of torrified briquette. Uh, yes, 20% is before the um, drying process. So this is the global warming um, potential results for the non-torrified briquette. Again, we're using gasifier in order to support our, uh, support our system. Um, in this case, grinding has a high contribution, which is also expected because um, grinding of um, non-torrified briquette energy consumption is higher compared to um, torrified wood, which is one of the reasons that we are um, using torrefaction so the torrified wood is more compatible um, with coal at the power plant that can be used with the existing infrastructure. But again, um, drying is the, um, has a high contribution as well, and this is mainly due to the um, propane used in this process. So if you look at the different coal firing ratios um, and the resulting environmental uh, global warming potential, so the first column is the generation of one kilowatt hour of electricity using 100% coal. 
And the uh, um, following two columns shows the 20% co-firing by um, NIG um, with terrified wood and non-terrified and non-terrified briquettes. We achieve around 17 to uh, 18 to 17 percent uh, reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions. And if we perform um, co-firing with 50 percent um, contribution, then we achieve around 44 percent reduction. And if you look at the overall reduction, if we are running, running the system with 100 percent certified briquettes, it would be around 88 percent um, lower greenhouse gas emissions compared to 100 percent uh, coal system. Um, so this is a fair comparison that assuming that um, we would be co-firing with 50 percent um, non-certified briquette, but um, as we know it's um, co-firing with non-certified wood is ratios are lower compared to certified wood where when we use certified briquettes we can increase the co-firing ratio from 5 to 10 to around 8 percent. And um, that's why we are using um, certified wood in here to be able to improve the co-firing ratio which would lead higher greenhouse gas um, emission reductions. And if you look at the difference between the certified and non-certified 100 percent application, there's 5 percent um, difference in the greenhouse gas emissions. And when we look at the different um, scenarios um, in terms of the remote power system used and the tor gas utilization, so the first two columns are the ones um, that the base scenarios we use 100% certified briquette, 100% non certified briquette, supported by gasifier, um, and we have tor gas utilization at the torrefaction unit. And the um, third column shows that if we flared torrefy um, the tor gas. Um, at the torrefaction unit instead of util utilization at the dryer, which um, it's uh, important to note that this system is electrically heated um, torrefaction system, so we can use the tor gas only at the dryer, um, so it cannot actually support the torrefaction unit. Therefore, we are only assuming the tor gas is um, utilized at the dryer process only. Um, so, if we are, when we are using the um, tor gas instead of flaring it. Um, we are achieving about 24 percent of um, reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions. And if we were actually running the non-terrified um, briquette and terrified briquette system together so that we can use the tor gas to support the drier process at the non-terrified briquette, um, we achieve around, um, I believe it's 10 percent reduction. And um, Last two columns show the uh, effect of using um, diesel power instead of tor gas, diesel power instead of wood gasifier in the system, uh, which has the highest impact compared to other scenarios. Um, so while applying wood gasifier to power the system instead of the diesel power, we um, reduce the emissions around 66 percent. And if we um, speculate that this torrefaction unit could be supported um, with uh, fuel instead of electricity just for heating pur purposes because we have high electricity consumption, um, it would actually decrease the, um, the greenhouse gas emissions from 0.38 um, kilograms CO2 equivalent to 0.2 kilograms CO2 equivalent. And the negative uh, impacts we have here represents the pile and burn credits for greenhouse gas emissions. And um, for our base case, 100% um, certified briquette electricity production, it um, allows us to decrease the overall impact by about 13 percent. And if we look at the other impact categories for the um, use of certified briquettes, for um, electricity production. Again, we see the um, high environmental benefits that we gain by avoided pile and burn emissions, especially in um, toxicity, smog acidification and eutrophication impact categories. Um, and we see a high contribution of um, perfection units and combustion in um, most of the impact categories as well mostly resulting from the uh, propane consumption 
and um, sodium hydroxide consumption at the torrefaction unit, which we produced by our oil because we had a condensation at the torrefier. And in order to dispose it to the um, it to the wastewater system, we need to neutralize the um, it's very acidic, so we neutralize it with sodium hydroxide. And if you consider um, its effect, it uh, has an effect of um, in many impact categories. So the concluding remarks are um, using torrefied briquettes has a substantial um, reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions if we um, coal fire it with coal or substitute coal with the torrefied briquettes. And using gasifier instead of diesel generator, especially for this particular system where you use electricity for heating, um, is very crucial as well. Um, and for the tor gas utilization in the system, it's, it's really crucial to use tor gas since we have high heating requirement, especially for the dryer, and a tor gas system which doesn't use electricity. So um, it should be, it's important to enhance the um, tor gas utilization systems in these processes as well. Um, and also, pile and burn credits show that it's very, um, it has notable effect in lowering the other environmental impacts in addition to greenhouse gas emissions. So now I will um, pass this on to Ted Bilek to talk about the economic analysis. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, talking about, yes, talking about the economics of this, does it make any sense to produce torrefied wood in a, from woody biomass in a near forest location. First, a quick review of, of what we're doing. We're getting waste, sorting and processing in the forest at the forest landing. We are converting this waste product into a finer ground product could be chips, um, it, it could be sawdust. We are maybe screening it and we are then torrifying it at a BCT site. Now there is there are arrows both going from the, the screening and the comminution because depending on how this product is processed, how the waste is processed, you may be able to avoid screening. Overall, I'm going to talk about, just quickly overview the, the system. I'm going to talk about how I did the economics analysis, talk a little bit about results, and then some conclusions. Why Torify? Well, that's been gone over already to reduce moisture, to re, uh, reduces the oxygen, increases the energy density, if a, it increases the energy density if the product itself is densified afterwards. It eases the comminution or the grindability of the product at the coal plant. Particularly, it increases the ability to coal fire with coal. Now that is that is key, but it is it is key to the technical aspects of the product. But it is it is also key to the economics and the markets of this product. What do you want to torrify? <clears throat> well, this was one of the things that we learned out of this whole process. I, I went into it not knowing a whole lot about torrefaction, thinking you could torrefy just about anything, and in fact you can, but the problem is that unless your product is reasonably uniform, you are not going to get uniform torrefaction in the resulting torrefied product, and therefore it won't burn, easy, it won't burn as evenly in the coal plant. You want a product without much variation, and that could be either wood chips screened or microchips or sawdust. 
we looked at the screening, uh, a couple different screening options, came up with a, the, the, the best option was, the, or the cheapest option was the star screen. We looked at a sawdust machine. This was something that we hadn't planned on originally looking at in the project. Han found this machine. It was really cool. It takes logs and rather than minimizing kerf on, the, on these logs, it maximizes kerf. It converts these logs into sawdust. Now, in all fairness, the, the logs that it converts aren't really saw logs, so I, I didn't feel too badly about it. But it, it produces a very, very nice product. And the microchippers. The, the microchipper, it, it turned out, produced the lowest cost product, or I should say the lowest cost uniform product. And so in the economic analysis, that I'm going to be presenting, I'm using the, the microchipper, uh, the microchipper feedstock cost. But something to be aware of here is that the torrifier feedstock input, look, look at the difference between the torrifier feedstock input and the productivity of the screeners and the sawdust machine and the microchipper. There's, there's a mismatch here. And that mismatch is going to be key in the logistics, or this, this mismatch logistics is going to be key in the economics of any system that you try and build. Trying to enable these machines to work full time will be important. So other markets, other than the torrifier at this scale would be important. Okay, so why briquette? There, there are a number of reasons to briquette. In the, the big reason for to briquette torrified wood, and this was something else that I didn't know, was that the torrefaction increases the energy content of the product by weight, but it does not increase the energy, it, it actually decreases the energy content by volume. Since you are usually limited in shipping by volume, you're limited in your chip van by volume and not by weight, torrefaction alone will be deep. It could, it could make your transport economics worse because your volume doesn't change very much with the torrefaction. So you're, you're shipping less energy per van unless you densify. So we densified into briquettes. They can, they can be made at a relatively small scale. It made sense for this kind of process. Uh, and the, the, our, the roof makes really nice briquetting machines that can be, they can be operated, well, the, the manufacturers say almost 24 seven without, without much labor involved. They're very robust units. What is a torrified briquette? Well, we have some briquettes that are obviously torrified on, on the far left. We have some that are not torrified in the middle. Well, yeah, kind of, sort of, it depends. It depends, what does it depend on? Well, it's going to depend on the what the customer wants, what the customer's needs are. And of course, how much you torrify, there, there is going to be a, a relationship between the 
amount of recovery that you get from the chips that you, chips or sawdust that you put into the torrified unit, if you don't torrify very much, you're going to get much higher recovery. If you torrify very heavily, you are going to get less recovery. It depends on what the customer wants. That recovery ratio is one of the key variables in the economics. We saw briefly the, previously the, the overall system, we're talking about a dryer, a torrifier, and then a briquetta on the end. This was kind of neat because it was the, the humble folks set this up to operate in one continuous system. Some basic assumptions. We were using the, the Norris Thermal Technology CM600. It is a commercial, uh, commercial unit. You can buy it off the shelf right now. A big assumption on this was the 108 kilowatt electrically heated screw. That turned out to be, well, an electrically heated screw provided a lot of consistency in the heat. It was very good for research purposes. An electrically heated screw, though, is taking electricity as the highest grade of energy, and you are converting the electricity into heat, which is the lowest grade of energy. You're doing that to torrify wood to create another energy product that's going to be turned into heat. So that 108 kilowatt electrically heated screw turned out to be one of the, uh, we'll call it negative factors in the economics. The electricity supply, there were various options. The gasifier turned out to be a bit more expensive electricity than the diesel gen set, but SEPTA noted that the gasifier does offer many environmental benefits over the diesel gen set. Um, this gas, it was a neat gasifier produced by All Power Labs. It uses the same chips that the, that the torrifier uses. Problem with it is that the gasifier was only only rated at oh I think it was 18 kilowatts and so you'd need quite a few of them if you were going to be using if you were going to be powering the electrically electrically heated screw in the 108 kilowatt torrifier. However, All Power Labs is building a larger unit, so we still felt that the gas gen set, that that gas gen set price was a, a reasonable one to be using for an electricity price. The product value at $220 per bone dry ton is somewhat speculative still. It is, it's based on uh, a, a ballpark figure that we got a, uh, about a year ago or so from the Boardman plant. Delivery costs arbitrarily set at about $40 per bone dry ton. This is a variable in the model that can easily be changed. I use discounted cash flow analysis. This slide is up there just to show you that there are a lot of variables going into it. I don't expect you to look at or, or work through any of them. It, it's just to show you that you can do a lot with the model. The results, the results are not that good. Um, negative NPVs all around, the internal rates of return have numb error uh, the signs. The reason that they, the reason that those values are error values is because all of the cash flows are negative. 
with all negative cash flows, by definition, the internal rate of return is negative infinity and Excel gives you this error message back. Break even of, of a bit more interest would be the break even average torrified product values. These are the prices that you would need to achieve at those nominal discount rates in the table in order to achieve net present values of zero. The net present value of zero means that you're exactly earning your alternative rate of return, the 10%, the 8.4%, or the 5.04% after tax. The break-even delivered feedstock cost tells you that you would need to be paid $128 per, per green ton in order to get your net present value of zero. So the economics of this plant do not look good. Some breakdowns just to show you where those costs are. You've got about 26% in capital costs, about 66% in variable costs. The big variable costs, the biggest ones are electricity, labor, and other variable costs and transportation. It's a small plant to be operated by just one worker, and it is possible that one worker could not, or you might not want just one worker running the plant for, um, for safety reasons. But the labor is quite high, as well as the electricity there. And then after finance and tax basis. I'm putting this up there just, just to show you that the, the capital assets, including finance costs, tax, and tax credits, shrinks way down. The reason that it shrinks way down is because you've got losses every year, and I've made the assumption in, in this graph that your firm does have some other income that you can take the tax losses against. If your firm does not have other income that it could take the tax losses against, then the, the economics would be even worse. The sensitivity analyses, I didn't, I'm not going to put those up because no matter what I did, they, the NPV still turned out to be negative. I did run all these sensitivity analyses. The markets for torrified briquettes, well, they, they are not yet really developed. You would have a competitive advantage. The competitive advantage of torrified wood is that you can ship it farther with higher energy density, especially if there are some carbon taxes or incentives not to burn coal that, that you can get. On a BTU basis, well, you, you can't compete with PRV coal, but really that shouldn't be what you're trying to compete against. A big market for Torrified wood will be the Boardman power plant in Oregon. They're, they're producing 8,000, or they, they would use about 8,000 tons per day. But you've got to realize that 8,000 tons a day is more than a year's production of this little tiny torrifier. In other words, one day's consumption at Boardman would take more than a year's production from this little plant. Conclusions, small scale near woods, electrically fired biomass torrification does not look like a real good idea from an economic perspective. The cost as presented could 
be lower. There's a lot of opportunity to lower cost, lower cost. Torrefaction could be done with waste heat. Sevda was looking at torrefaction with waste heat in her LCA analysis. The, the propane could be eliminated. You could reduce your per unit labor costs by increasing the size. And if a client required a less torrefied product, you could get higher product recoveries. That's all that I have, so I guess at this point I will pass it over to Rick to help moderate questions. Thanks, Ted. Thanks, everybody. Um, so during the course of the, the presentation, we have been uh, getting some uh, questions in our chat box. I, think, I believe most of them have been some of them have been answered. Uh, we do plan on, and let's see, I think we answered most of them. There's one question on on binders. Was additional binders used to produce the ro robust briquettes? No. The answer is no. We do not use any binders in this application. I know it's sometimes common to use that in different densification systems, but not in this one. Let's go into some of the questions. So what is it? I guess it might be a question for Ted. What is the assumed size of torrefaction plant, tons per year product? The, the plant was uh, rated at, oh, I've forgotten if it, I, I don't know the tons per year, but I think it was, uh, I've forgotten if it was 15 tons or 18 tons per day. Is what yeah, uh, that was through that was throughput. This was this is Mark. Um, we it, it was doing about half a ton an hour, um, which would be uh, roughly 12 tons per day, running 24 hours a day. Which was actually, it, as far as we know, one of the larger demonstration plants that's been that's been uh, demonstrated. Thank you, Mark. A question. Uh, let's get a question. Uh, a new question that came in about uh, the durability of the briquettes in terms of water resistance. Um, but I don't know, Mark. Could you answer that question on that? Cause, uh, yes, I do. Um, I don't see the specific question, but the the durability of the torrefied briquettes was um, in many cases is very similar to the uh, raw briquettes. So for example, the raw briquettes tested at maybe 95% durability, which means that after you uh, basically tumble them around and shake them up, 5% uh, of the mass is lost. That's 95% that's durability um, for the raw briquettes. And so for the torrefied ones, we were seeing numbers in the high 80%, low 90%. Um, so they actually binded together quite well um, without uh, any additives. Um, Exposing the briquettes to different moisture and humidity fluctuations changed the durability a bit, and we saw that if if they were transported, um, for example, over like an eight-day period, experiencing rain and rain and temperature fluctuations, that the uh, durability actually dropped a little bit more for the torrefied briquettes than it did for the raw briquettes. So that's something we're looking into. But in general, the, the durability was, was quite high and comparable for, for both cases. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mark. Let's see. There's a... Uh... A question, a number of questions coming in. I believe there's one question about the, uh, I'm not sure if we can answer that one, about the commercial production rate of torrefied wood. There's a there's potential this technology in terms of production to have a measurable impact. 
on the utilization nationally of underutilized forest residues. Um, I guess I can partially answer that question now is uh, it, I guess is whether or not I guess how applicable this technology is for the different regions. So we tested, we actually got collected data from, from five different sites. Actually, probably more sites than that, but there was five sites that became the which we used for our, for our analysis. And these were actually uh, um, based upon the economic viability of these different sites. So, and these are the, the most productive sites in the uh, Pacific Northwest. I guess I don't have a percentage value. Um, I think this other question has been answered about uh, torrefaction systems being available. Uh, Ted, Ted answered that one about uh, the, Norse, the Norse system is commercially available. I think it's a price that was listed on his slide of $600,000. Yeah. Let's see. I think we answered this question earlier too is about the, uh, the biomass uh, moisture content removed from the forest residue moisture content. The residue is actually is dried uh, typically for a year. So it is going to come into the facility about 20%. And as noted, typical uh, forest residues are around 50% plus or minus 5% moisture content on a, on a wet basis. Let's see. Let's see, we got, uh, there's a number of questions coming in, so I'm trying to answer as much as possible here. A couple are initially about grinding at the power plant, um, and that actually is what needs to be done for the, for the material that comes in if you want to uh, use it in, the, in, the, in a, a coal-fired facility because it needs to be in a dust form. And that's the reason why torrefied wood is, is would be a, a much more a better product for a coal plant to use than a, a wood, just a, a raw wood product. Or Mark again. I think Mark answered that question on percent ash already. So let's see. I've got a question for Ted. Uh, is the Excel-based economic model available for download? It is not yet available for download. I plan on making it available for download so that users can put in their own assumptions uh, regarding taxes, recoveries, whatever. Yes. It eventually will be. It will be available. More than likely, it will probably be posted on the Waste of Wisdom website. Yes. Yeah if not on our own website here at the Forest Products Lab. Let's see, the next question is from Stephen Lawn. I should probably say the people's name. Stephen Lawn had a question about his torrefaction temperature. Is the, is the uh, wood fully, fully torrefied? Well, I think Ted kind of brought in, mentioned that, that uh, we can actually torrefy at different percentages. And, uh, and we actually can, using the electric heated screw, can much more easily torrefy that wood into up to 100 percent than some of, some of the other heat systems are currently available. Um, Rick, a, a, just a, a note on that. This particular torrefaction system said um, they they advertise on their website. Norris advertises, I should say, on its website that with this torrifier, it can also produce biochar. So I, I showed the range of briquettes, and what do you want to say, what do you want to call fully torrified? Yes, it can do it, but how far do you want to go with it is the, is the question. And that will have an impact on the product recovery, which can would tip can go from maybe 90% for very lightly torrefied down to 70% for the conversion that we were assuming down to maybe 30% or less for biochar. So, so we have a question for, for is it an answer or not from uh, Matt Delaney. I don't Again, think, I don't think we did answer that question. 
What? I don't, I don't think we answered the question. We have not. Okay. You want to give an answer to it? So the question is on, uh, is the improved uh, global warming profile for a purified wood versus pellet burning a function of displacing coal energy emissions of, uh, can or improved greenhouse gas benefits of purified compared to greenhouse gas emissions of tile burning. Um, so greenhouse gas emission benefits for the purified wood actually included the pile and burn benefits as well. So 20% coal firing um, included the benefits of um, Displacing the combustion emissions of, with, of coal with terrified briquettes plus the pile and burn emission reduction or avoided pile and burn emission. Thank you. Let's see, there were a number of other questions coming in too. Uh, maybe, we'll, maybe this question, we forgot a question for uh, Mark on uh, the durability again. What happens if briquettes in a heavy rain event, which lasts more than an hour, do the briquettes, dis do the torrified briquettes dis disintegrate or break apart? So I think you answered part of that already, but maybe you can go in more detail. Um, yes, we weren't able to do an exact rain test. However, um, I could say this, the bri briquettes will not last um, if they're submerged in water, um, like dropped in a bucket, we tried that. But what we did do is put them in an extremely humid environment um, for multiple weeks, which was um, 50 degrees C and 95% relative humidity, and they um, held together quite well, the torrified briquettes, better than the, what the raw briquettes could do. So um, our analysis with uh, the, these kind of set test methods was that they can um, they absorb less water than the Robicats, and they're able to, to hold their form and durability a little bit um, during a, a heavy rain or high temperature humidity uh, condition. Uh, okay. Well, thanks, Mark. We have some, actually have some earlier questions that I don't think have been answered yet. Uh, one is from Dan McCollum. Uh, he has a question, is the APC gas of fire also produces biochar in addition to sink gas used to generate electricity? Does the biochar provide, uh, uh, I'm not sure. So our machine, I don't, I'm not sure what, maybe Dan can elaborate on that because we're talking about torrefaction, not gasifying, but maybe we can, gain, maybe we can talk to Dan offline on that one. Second, another question from Chris St. Germain. How do you transport forest residues to the secondary processing site? Um, I believe there were by log truck. Log truck. By log truck, I believe. Uh, was there any analysis? I think, you, I think Ted showed us some analysis on transporting that information. Let's see. Uh, I guess another question for Ted. What percent of torrefied wood and non-torrefied wood would make a break even cost? Here's your one, I guess. Sorry, I don't understand. So I guess the question is that perhaps there's a is there is there a break even point in making torrefied wood versus torrefied briquettes versus non-torrefied briquettes? Is there a break even cost between the two? I guess for like that analysis. That specific analysis, I have, I, I have not run. Because there is some economic benefit so, just, just of briquetting the, the yeah, biomass. Yeah, there, there is, there is economic benefit just, just to making briquettes from microchips, say. But and there is good market for making briquettes from. Probably microchips. Certainly, there is there is good market. You can go on the internet and do do a search on wood briquettes and see that you can buy them in bulk um, for I don't know two hundred seventy dollars a ton or something like that. Um, that look like they're produced from a roof briquetter. 
I have I have not done I have not done that analysis. That will be coming. Um, I will be doing it. That will be part of the Waste to Wisdom report, final report. The question from Harry Groot, how does Torified product compare to biochar? We haven't done that yet. That may be, uh, I think if you Come, listen, listen, to, listen to the next webinar. To the webinar, next webinar on biochar, we'll talk more about that. Maybe Ted will have some uh, details on that as well. Uh, question from Sebastian Granados. With increasing the flow rate to the plant instead of of 10 to 15 tons per day to higher values, but 100 to 500 tons per day make the economics better? Yes, of course. Right, yes. Uh, exactly, we're not sure yet, but uh, uh, anything else, Ted? Yeah, uh, especially if you do not have to increase labor by, by very much. And yes, that would that would help the economics. And typically, the capital costs also will not increase linearly. Uh, if you with with that sort of an increase, you might expect an increase of say to the power of 0.6 rather than rather than one. So yes, your economics would improve considerably. Provided, of course, that your haul distances did not increase too much. Thanks, Ted. So, uh, excuse me if I, ha if I haven't answered some of your questions. I'm getting some questions from Tom Waddell as well. Um, we're actually at 1 o'clock Central Time, so it's been an hour. I think we might want a few more minutes over, but uh, most of this information will will be available later on. If, if, people are, if people are going to be signing off, I want to let people know that uh, thank you for attending today's webinar. Feel free to reach out to any of us, leave our contact details on the slide or use the contact form on the site. The web address is shown below. If you'd like to revisit this webinar, it'll be posted very soon to the Waste of Wisdom webinars page at wasteofwisdom.com slash webinars. I think we're going to maybe, maybe address a few more questions. Uh, before we uh, go ahead and uh, some of these questions, I'm not sure if we have an answer to you. This, this is Ted. I did note there was a question on the biochar that was produced in the All Power Labs gen set. Yes, I did incorporate. The answer is yes, I did incorporate that into the electricity price. The biochar, the production of biochar reduced the electricity price. I was assuming that the biochar would be selling for $1,800 a ton for that, the electricity price of 42 cents or whatever it was that, that I came up with. If you increase the biochar price, of course, the electricity price would then drop. If you decrease the biochar price, then that electricity price from the all-power unit would increase. But yes, it is it is a co-product that, that does reduce the electricity price. Thanks, Ted. Um, the question from Eldon Ganoff, what is the present production in the U.S.? A torrified wood. Very low. Very a very low number right now. We don't know. We don't. We don't know though. Uh, let's see. The question from Will Scarvan. Will you can you explain a bit more detail why binders were not allowed in your trials? Will developing binders for torrified material and aware of others working in this area as well. I guess the only answer we have for that, Will, is that we don't currently need the, the binders to maintain the, 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 the durability or structure of the, of the briquettes. There wasn't anything about that allowed. Right. And we, uh, we could have used them if you needed to. Uh, Mark, do you have anything to add on that? Uh, I don't have anything to add other than we were just trying to, we were, we were trying to make briquettes without the binders and we found that it worked quite well when the, when the conditions were appropriate. So we, we just stuck with that. 
Let's see. Okay. Uh, oh. Okay. I guess one more one more question. That's on, on shipping torrefied wood in powder form. Uh, the answer we asked from Ajor uh, Thomas. We do not know that that would be something that's uh, we did not consider it. I'm not sure how, in terms of safety, how good an idea it is. Sort of the the of the. Uh, the the dust issue, maybe, perhaps, with that tr transportation. Um, and there'd also be a lot more grinding energy up front. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and uh, end uh, the webinar. And just be sure that uh, we have another webinar coming up on August 23rd. It's going to be uh, the life cycle assessment and economics of biochar from forest residues. They can register at wasteofwisdom.com slash webinars. I want to thank everybody for their time, and once again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, feel free to contact any of the presenters today with their contact information available on this slide. Thanks again. Take care.